As we continue our conversation on combating Islamophobia, uh, our next uh, speaker uh, plays a critical role uh, in policy and advocacy and in driving change. We're honored to have with us today a leader who has been at the forefront of these efforts at the governmental level. I'd like to introduce former Attorney General and current candidate for MLA, Nikki Sharma, who served, um, who served as the Attorney General of BC from 2020 to 2024. Nikki has been a passionate advocate for human rights, social justice, and inclusivity throughout her career. As the first woman of South Asian descent to hold the position of Attorney General in BC, her work has often focused on breaking down barriers and ensuring that our communities are safer and more inclusive for everyone. Today, Nikki will speak on the topic of governmental approaches to combating Islamophobia and prom promoting inclusivity. She will provide insight into the policies and initiatives that have been implemented to address Islamophobia at the provincial level the successes and challenges of these approaches, and how to further work towards protecting our communities. Please welcome her to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's nice. I have a little step stool to make me look taller. Um, hello, everyone. It's so great to be here and to see all these lovely faces gathered here today in this very important discussion. I want to start by apologizing that I wasn't able to be here um, earlier, as it's been a pretty busy day, but I, I'm sure you had a very informative time here today. Just want to say uh, it's great to be here on the, on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth people. And we start by acknowledging that every time we speak, but it seems extra important today now that um, we know tomorrow is the day that we will uh, remember residential school survivors and the terrible history. Um, that we have in Canada and how they were treated. Um, the BC Muslim uh, Women's Forum is such a, oh, I'm is it not that? So I'm tall, <laughs> I'm not sure. I was just at, a, at an event with the, um, the former Premier David Eby and I've never been accused of being tall, so <laughs> especially not next to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not, but thank you. Um, and it's so great to be here and I, I love the theme, it's courage and leadership. And I just have to say, that if you get a group of women together, they can solve anything. I know it. I know it. The leadership, the resilience, and the brilliance of women when they come together. So I just want to raise my hands to all the organizers for this because I just see so much potential, even in the short time that I've been here. Um, you know, I, I think that the topic today um, Islamophobia and the rise of it, it, it always hits me, um, and I know way more to all of you, really close to the heart. Um, I, I've been in the role, or had been in the role of Attorney General, now I'm a candidate, we all know we're in a provincial election right now, um, and I really was trying to figure out what I could do to make it better, hearing stories of women, especially women that were on the streets, wearing a hijab and what they faced with the rise of Islamophobia. Um, I'm on the campaign trail right now, and, and that means you put yourself out there for everybody, and that's democracy, but you know you're gonna face. I always do, I got called a, a terrorist the other day knocking on a door, um, and I just know that's gonna happen to me, right? And I, I know that that weighs on all of our hearts and all of our minds when we're out there in the public, but I also wanna say, it means even more that we have to take up those spaces, that we need to stand there strong in what we believe in and what we bring to the table and not back down, no matter what. Um, and I think that that power is what changes the world and changes spaces of power and makes it so no matter what is thrown at us, we can make that change in government, in universities, in, you know, in mental health, all of those places that I've already heard some of the leaders here today say. So it is with that leadership and courage that to change lies, and I just wanna raise my hands to all of you for being a part of that and for building upon this. I, before I go into what, um, what I think the tools of government to tackle hate and Islamophobia are and what we've been implementing, I wanna acknowledge Heike Chima, who's here today. Um, <laughs> 
When I became Attorney General, I had the great fortune of having uh, Heike Chima serve as the Assistant Deputy Minister in, in implementing anti-racism policy in this province. And the work that I was honored to do with her um, was really inspiring, and, and not only that, uh, it's going to change the province. So I feel really lucky to, be, to have that experience, and I'm glad she's here today. Um, what is government's responsibility when it comes to Islamophobia and tackling hate? Um, somebody like myself who's experienced it being in a position to understand what the tools of the justice system are, which is really what the Attorney General can think about, right, in our ministry, um, in my previous ministry. And I, I see it at different levels. So one is tackling online hate. I think we can all agree that what happens online is not something that is way out there and doesn't show up in our day-to-day -day life anymore. It does. When there's hate spreading online, when there's hate that's out there that, that, um, that, that goes about, raises Islamophobia, spreads online, it, we, it shows up in all of our lives. And I think there needs to be more accountability when it comes to online hate. We were grateful to partner with um, um, Tarek and the team at uh, Foundation for a Path Forward to understand what online hate is showing up in British Columbia, to understand um, where we need to put resources in across this province to combat that. And the next part of that, which is part of the journey that I was on um, as Attorney General before, was holding online platforms accountable for what we all see in our society. Um, that's spreading all of this um, in ways that really does hurt people in real life. Um, the next thing is government services, right? We as a provincial government, we, do, we provide services across this province, whether it's health care, schools, um, you know, social services. We're on the front lines of helping people. So it's so important that none of our services have racism and hate within them, that the people that are out there delivering those services um, are not perpetuating what we think is what we see as systemic racism or those things that stand in the way of people accessing those services. So we we got to work um, a few years ago, and this is part of the work that we did together at the ministry. First of all, collecting data so it wasn't invisible anymore what people were facing. Um, it's crazy to think that a lot government has a lot of data, but we didn't actually understand fully how bar what the barriers were in our government services that people were facing. And then the next part of that was taking action on it. So um, I was able to introduce anti-racism legislation um, in the last session of, par of, of the legislature in Victoria. And what that does is hold government services accountable to the systemic racism that they see. And it, it, different communities will experience it differently, and Islamophobia is one of that. And it should not be showing up in our government services. So every ministry, um, once they receive that data, has to respond to it. And I think that's where we'll get, uh, we'll get at that institutional change that we all need. And we need your voice as part of that. I'll say that the work, we're in the election right now, so whatever government forms um, after October 19th, they need to make sure, we need to make sure that work continues. We need to make sure that your voice and how you're experiencing Islamophobia is included in the conversation of how we get rid of that within government services. So I'll leave that. Um, and the other one is schools. So, Kids going to school and need to understand what does, how discrimination shows up and they need to have a safe, inclusive environment. So we've made it mandatory for every K-12 to, K to school to have anti-racism training. And that includes like understanding things like Islamophobia and how it shows up for different people. Um, and I think that's really important because uh, kids need to have a really safe environment. Um, when they go to school. I mean, I think probably everybody and I have a memory of this, the first time I experienced racism in my school when I was a kid. And once you have that first experience, it changes your, your sense of belonging and safety within your community. And helping kids understand um, uh, how to stop that and to feel strong in who they are, I think, is, is vitally important. The other thing is on the streets. Um, I have to tell you that... Uh, um, and we're in the, the work about the, with mental health and, and how um, Muslim women are facing that. I remember the first time you shared the stories that you were, you were seeing of just the feeling of unsafety on this, that, that women feel on the streets. And I got to tell you, that makes me so angry when I hear these stories, that somebody in British Columbia can feel like walking on the street, expressing their identity, can be unsafe. And I know that that's a reality. 
uh, for a lot of people, and I know that it's gotten worse. And um, we need to make sure that our institutions and our services on the front line are acknowledging that as hate and responding to it. Um, and that's been one of the key priorities that I've had um, in my previous role. What that was making sure that police have the training that they need to understand what a hate crime is and how it shows up. For those people that don't want to call the police because they feel like that's something that um, feels like unsafe to them, we launched a service um, that was a racist incident helpline to help people connect with uh, services and supports that we, we need that, to make sure that they're safe, but also they can get supported by the, the appropriate community to help that, um, them overcome that. And we've also invested in Resilience BC, which is a network of organizations across this province that are there on the front lines of people um, that are experiencing hate. I know that there's so much more work to do, um, but the one thing that I started with, which is the, the fact that if you get a whole bunch of women together, you're going to solve problems. So I just want to encourage all of you that as you sit here and you think about the specific challenge of Islamophobia and how Muslim women show up in, in solutions in different levels of institutions, I just want to encourage you to keep getting involved. With your voice and your experience at the table, that's where the change really comes. And I know that it's hard, and I know that we always face barriers when we push our way to those tables and we push our way past those barriers to sit there. But the power in that is something that really inspires me. And the reason that I felt like it was so important to come here today um, and, and our, busy, our busy campaign um, that we're on right now every day. So I want you to know that you're valued, that you're important, that the, the, the challenges that you face of Islamophobia, we need to fight every day to make sure it doesn't happen. And we, we need the tools of government to be focused on that. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for having me here today.